Welcome to the future, where drivers will become passengers and computers will become chauffeurs. Whether we call them driverless, self-driving, or autonomous vehicles, they're already being tested on our roads and picking up passengers on our streets. Equipped with motion detectors, light sensors, cameras, artificial intelligence, and a massive amount of mapping data, they can turn, accelerate, brake, park, and we hope never get in an accident. Whether we hop into the back seat or stand on the sidewalk, one fact won't change. Autonomous cars are coming. They will revolutionize our relationship to the automobile and transform a basic aspect of life, getting from point A to point B. But how does this remarkable technology work? Is it safe? And when will it be available? Hello, I'm Val Zavala. Welcome to this special edition of Town Hall Los Angeles. We'll get answers to some of those questions and more from a preeminent expert in the field, a man at the vanguard of this exciting technology, Dr. Ken Washington. Dr. Washington is Vice President of Research and Advanced Engineering at the Ford Motor Company. He oversees the development and the implementation of the company's technology strategy and plans. Dr. Washington, thank you so much for being here. Here's my first basic question. I want to launch into the future. It is 2025. I'm in downtown Los Angeles. For whatever reason, I need a ride from point A to point B. What might pick me up? Well, if it's 2025, the future has arrived. We're working on autonomous vehicles today. And by 2025, your experience will begin with the simple request for an autonomous ride service, knowing that a vehicle will show up and you can get into the backseat of that vehicle and it will safely take you to where you want to go. But more than that, by 2025, these vehicles will be smart. They'll know who you are. They'll be able to give you an experience in the backseat that's designed for riders as opposed to for drivers. Because think about it. It's all about time and it's all about making your life better. Because if we can give you time back, by enabling you to do things while you're being driven in a self-driving or autonomous vehicle, that's gonna make your life better. And it also might make your life better if you're trying to get to another location and you can't drive or you don't wanna drive because you remember what it was like back in 2016 when you lived in an environment that was congested and driving was not a fun experience and it was taking time away from other things that you'd rather do. So how might it work? Do I call up a, a car on, my, on a mobile app? And well, how does it know where I want to go? We haven't fully designed the experience yet. And that's one of the things we're working on. Um, and so in addition to the technology of enabling the car to navigate safely to your destination, we're working on the full ecosystem of how would you actually interact with the right service? How would you call up the vehicle? How would you make the request? These are relatively straightforward questions, but how we design that experience should be tailored to you and your needs and your wants. And that's what we're working on trying to understand. So let's dive right into the technology because that is the hardest thing. First of all, it gives an idea how many of these driverless cars exist right now. Are there many? We're in active development right now. And by the end of this year, we will have 30 fully autonomous test vehicles on the road being tested in Michigan, in California, and in Arizona. And by next year, we're going to more than triple that number and have uh, 100 vehicles wow. uh, on the road being tested and developed uh, as part of our development effort to uh, get us to the point where we'll have fully autonomous vehicles available for making people's lives better in, by 2021. So about 100 of them will be out there. And talk about the technology, because we all know what it takes to drive. This is why so many of us are so interested in this. We realize that we're seeing, hearing, sensing, and you know our brains are computing masses amount of data to help us avoid that cat or to make the right turn. So how on earth can you get a computer to manage to perceive and process so much data? There must be systems on top of systems on top of systems. 
Well, first of all, it's important that to, to spend a little time uh, understanding definitions. So when we say fully autonomous vehicle, we really mean fully autonomous without a steering wheel, without brakes, without a gas pedal. No steering wheel no in the car? No steering. In this ride service, it's for you to ride in, not to drive in. Oh, my gosh. And so the whole idea is for the computer and the hardware to handle the driving task. And so that's important to start with as a definition. So once you understand that definition, you'll go back to, well, how do we drive as humans? We see the, the environment and we react to it. Computers can do all of that, but more. I mean, we can actually map the environment that you're gonna be riding in ahead of time and annotate the things on that map so that we know what's there. We know where the trees are, we know where the curbs are, we know where the stop signs are, we know where the stoplights are, we know how wide the street is, we even know ahead of time where the lines on the road are because we map the environment with a high resolution mapping sensor called is it LIDAR. Pre -mapped or it's pre mapped? Oh, I see. That's really important because that gives us a definition of the geographical area with the specifics that the vehicle can then drive in. But it has to be updated constantly. I mean, not what if constantly. They, they do a little change in the road or somebody plants a tree. Right. So we do need a prior map. And then, in addition to that, we sense the world in real time with multiple sensors on the vehicle. The combination of those two gives you a very accurate view of the world and how you need to navigate safely through it. It also is used to help locate the vehicle precisely on the road within a few centimeters, whether or not the vehicle can see the lines in the road at the time that it's driving. That's really important. That's something we call localization. And then on top of all of that, there's very sophisticated software algorithms that are, are using techniques called machine learning, using uh, software that basically mimics how the brain works, mm -hmm. and it allows the images that the sensors capture to be interpreted smartly so that the vehicle knows where to go, when to turn, when not to turn, knows where the things in the road are, including pedestrians, animals, other objects that might appear in real time. This is a very hard problem, and I, and I want to make sure everyone recognizes that this is not something you can just whip together overnight. We've been at this for over 10 years, oh. and we have lots of experience in what works, what doesn't work, and how to move forward in a way that actually can do it well. But how about snow, fog, rain, dark? I mean, it's dark, it, and the lights sometimes are confusing even you know, to our human eyes. It has to change the way it perceives its environment for all these different conditions? Yeah, let's start with dark, because that's an interesting scenario. It turns out that the, one of the most important sensors we have on our vehicles are uh, something called LIDAR. That stands for light detection and ranging. And it's basically a sensor that shoots light that then bounces off of objects and then it, re it receives the signal back so that visible it Visible light? It shoots visible light? It shoots invisible light. Oh. It's, in the, um, it's in the invisible right. spectrum. And the whole point of that is that the sensor is providing the light, so it can be dark, and the sensor oh. performs just as well as when it's uh, daylight. It actually performs better in the dark than it does in daylight um, because there's no other light that it could uh, uh, confuse with its light. So we use LIDAR to determine where the objects are in the environment, and that is really important because it allows us to sense in multiple conditions, including dark. The other thing about LiDAR is the LiDARs that we're working with, one of our partners that we made an investment in, Velodyne, that company and others like it are working on extending the range of the LiDAR sensors so that it can sense out to hundreds of meters. We're, we're aiming to do that up to 200 meters in real time. So if you just do a quick calculation, you'll, you'll learn that um, you need to see about 200 meters if you're driving at highway speeds in order to react quickly enough to avoid, uh, to avoid an obstacle. So. How will it detect an emergency vehicle? Because for us, it's audio. You know, we hear the siren. Will autonomous cars hear? So that's one of the scenarios we're working on um, is the addition of uh, audible sensors. Today, we don't have audible sensors on our vehicles. But our team in our Palo Alto Research Lab is working on a, an experiment to assess how to do that and integrate it into our sensor suite. So we have some time between now and 2021 to fully develop all of these capabilities and integrate them into our vehicle. That's somewhat what makes it fun. This is a hard enough problem that we need to go at it from multiple angles. 
uh, including researching new methods for sensing the world and including uh, new sensors like audible sensors. I want to move on to probably the single biggest issue, safety. I'm going to ask right away, there's 30 cars that you're testing, there's going to be 100 or so. Have there been any accidents yet? There have been a few reports of minor accidents by other, uh, other technology developers of autonomous vehicles. You know, if you just do a search on the web, you'll, you'll see what they are. There have been no accidents on the, within the Ford fleet. Uh, but for us, um, this is a very important point. Uh, we are in the mobility business. You know, more than 100 years ago, our founder put the world on wheels, and, and it changed people's lives. It changed people's lives by giving them freedom. And, and this is kind of happening again. The whole notion of autonomous vehicles that will allow you to ride when you can't drive or don't want to drive or when it's really taking a lot of time out of your life and so it's inconvenient and it's a hassle and it's not fun, this is going to give people freedom back. But the freedom only matters if it's safe freedom. So safety for us is really paramount. So we are evaluating and testing our autonomous vehicles in multiple scenarios. We're approaching safety with a scenario-based strategy. What matters is what scenarios can you handle so that all things that you might run into can be uh, handled within, um, within safe parameters. But that's infinite. I mean, the number of variables they are. How on earth do you program for every possible scenario, every possible situation? Now, clearly, you can't do everything, right? But it's very important that you um, you provide a safe vehicle that's significantly safer than a human driver. Hundreds mm -hmm. of uh, millions of people die every year from car accidents. Mainly human error, by the way. And most of those yeah. are driven by human error. Yeah. So if we, can, uh, if we can focus on how many lives we'll save and how much safer these vehicles are than the current status, that's a huge benefit to society. And that's, that's making people's lives better, and it's also making people's lives safer. And we're really excited about that, and it's really important for us. Of course, you know what will happen, though. You can have 100 accidents because of human error and one accident in the driverless car. Which one's going to get the headline, right? <laughs> so. that, that's, that's, that's understandable. Yeah. And so this is not unlike in other technologies that are new to society. Mm. Whenever society sees a new, uh, sufficiently advanced and unrecognizable technology like autonomous vehicles, the adoption and, and um, the tension that it gets when things don't go right are, um, is understandably high. And so this is just going to take time. Is it actually legal to drive autonomous cars on our roads yet? In certain states, it's, it's legal to test autonomous vehicles test. with a safety driver. Okay. And so one of the things that we're working on is in partnership with many of our competitors and also technology companies, having a, a unified, coordinated conversation with policymakers so that we can inform the policymakers about what would help um, society by establishing regulations and policies that allow this technology to develop and this technology to advance mm. safely and introduce them into society. These are conversations that are just beginning and they really need to accelerate. We need to work this as an industry, not as an individual company. In fact, the U.S. Department of Transportation just recently came out with some guidelines, correct? What are those guidelines? Do? Yes, they How did. They, they began, these guidelines began to define the guardrails uh, within which the the um, multiple states can establish policies so that we can begin to do this kind of testing. But one of the things that would really um, make it difficult would be as if the rules are different in each state, oh, right? And so right. it's important to have some kind of federal guidelines so that all the states can begin to converge toward a common process and a common set of policies. That makes sense. And I believe the Department of Transportation laid out a 15-item checklist, basically safety checklist that all the developers of autonomous cars have to meet. That's correct. And this checklist is, is a set of federal guidelines that's very helpful for you know, helping everyone move toward a, a common set of policies and, and practices for ensuring that these te technologies enter society in a way that's going to be safe. So the main thing here is that so many times technology gets ahead of regulation of government. This is one time where we're really trying to work together and talk to each other as as it goes along, as it develops? That's a fair characterization. The technology is advancing very quickly. 
Um, and one of the things that we've seen is that the technology is advancing much more quickly than, than many people had originally predicted. Uh, that also is not too unusual. It's typical for technologies to accelerate as uh, innovations get in front of us. So let's talk about accessibility, the actual use, and the cost. How will these first enter our lives? Will we you know, be able to go to a dealer and buy one and not drive it home and put it in our <laughs> garage and, <laughs> and then it's there whenever we want? How, how, will it, how will it blend into our current transportation ecosystem? Well, these vehicles will be, um, uh, will have many more sensors and have a lot of software and some compute hardware in them, so they'll be more expensive. And it's not likely, in fact, we believe that the first introduction of these vehicles will not be personally owned vehicles. You won't go to the okay. dealer and buy them initially. You'll experience these vehicles in a ride service first, where where you need to get somewhere and that ride service has an autonomous vehicle as opposed to a vehicle driven by a driver. Mm -hmm. And the reason we believe that is because the economics make the most sense. Mm. While the vehicle is more expensive, the ride service can actually be less expensive because you're not paying for a driver, the vehicles are used in a much you know, higher duty cycle. Our vehicles that we buy today, we use them about 5% of the time. Isn't that incredible? 95% of the time they're sitting in a parking they're garage or in a garage mm -hmm, or in a mm -hmm, parking mm -hmm. space somewhere. These autonomous vehicles, if they're in a ride service, it'll be exactly the inverse. They'll likely be used 90 to 95% of the time. So there'll be fewer cars on the road, but more miles driven or more miles ridden in this case. Mm -hmm. So given that scenario, you and I and others and our friends and our family They'll be able to experience these autonomous vehicles when they hail them to come pick them up and safely and comfortably take them to their destination. And while they're going there, they've got time back. They can check their email, they can call their friends, they can review the briefing uh, that they need to review before they go to their next meeting. Or if you've just had a rough day, you might get a cat nap in the back seat. <laughs> so and this take, is really exciting. It won't take long before there's a video screen and you can call up your favorite sitcom yeah. and <laughs> enjoy the ride with a little bit of entertainment as well. We're actually looking at that. Oh, yeah. uh, how would you, what kind, of, uh, what kind of an infotainment device would you put in the back seat? So all of these are about enabling the right kind of user experience to make your life better. Wow. It's also been mentioned that this could be very freeing for seniors, um, for those with you know, disabilities. How might that work? Well, you know, there, there are a lot of folks who uh, need help to be mobile. Mm -hmm. As I said, mobility is freedom. And if you're a senior or if you're disabled, uh, you've lost that ability to have that freedom with your own action. This would enable you to use an autonomous vehicle service and have that freedom again. Now you still may need to have assistance to get in and out of the vehicle, but we think that kind of um, assistance combined with the autonomous vehicle would be a much more uh, enabling uh, mobility option for a senior or a disabled person than you know, mm -hmm. asking a friend to drive them the entire way right. or That's to... True. Um, yeah, you know, just opt out to not go anywhere because it's uh, it's inconvenient or it's too expensive. The economics of an autonomous vehicle ride service are actually very attractive. Our analysis indicates that it could be significantly less expensive than um, taxis or car uh, really? driver-driven vehicles, and uh, roughly about the same price as personally owned vehicle transport. Do you imagine that these vehicles would be um, gas powered or like, what's the best fuel source for autonomous vehicles? Because you don't want to be filling up. I don't know, how would that work? Well, in a, in a ride service, they would mm -hmm. be part of a, of a, of a fleet. Mm -hmm. And so you need to have fleet management services. These mm -hmm. vehicles have to be maintained. And so they would, uh, they would need to be refueled. And that refueling could be um, with a hydrocarbon gas fuel or it could be electric refueling. Our current test fleet is a hybrid internal combustion engine vehicle. It's our fusion hybrid. Mm -hmm. And um, we could accommodate a, a battery electric vehicle in the, as the powertrain. Um, and as the range it, it As range increases, it may be an attractive option. Um, we haven't uh, selected what powertrain we want to use yet for our 2021 service. We're just uh, getting all the more technology. More to come on that front. <laughs> We're focused on the uh, autonomous technology at the moment. 
Do you think that this will be uh, culturally accepted? Do you think it, we're going to find, you know, the people who are just, no way, you'll never find me in one of those cars without a steering wheel, and then you'll be other people who will just say, yes, I'm there, sign me up. Have there been any kind of research about the public's reaction? Yeah, we think the same kind of adoption curves will happen for autonomous vehicles that have happened for other advanced technologies. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think back to the internet when that came and email became available, I, I still remember, you know, many people in my family saying, I'm never going to use email or I'll never get a cell phone or, or when they did, they said, well, maybe I'll have uh, my assistant print out my emails and I'll read them. And, <laughs> you know, and so those adoption, uh, slow, gradual adoption curves happened in that those industries. And the same thing we think will happen here. There'll be early adopters who just kind of jump right in, mm -hmm, just like mm -hmm. with email and cell phones, and then they'll love the service and they'll talk about it. The key for that adoption to grow is for us to provide a great experience yeah. and for it to be truly um, freedom enabling, as we believe it will be. About, it's kind of like well, how we put the world on wheels over 100 years ago. We hope to do that again, really enable people to have freedom. And as they experience that freedom, we want it to be really a great, a great experience. Mm -hmm. and, and then they'll talk about it. They'll put it on social media and they'll, it'll spread. And we think it'll, it'll get a, a adoption over time. I think for the slower adopters, probably my guess is it's going to be the safety issue that is premier uh, front in mind. And so I had a question about that. Let's say you're in a, a driverless car, an autonomous car, and you're following the rules, but actually safety requires that you, say, make an illegal lane change or avoid something that you can't predict. So in other words, how does the car decide, oops, I'm not going to follow the rules, I'm going to break the rules for the sake of keeping my passenger how, safe? How does that how do you program something like that into the car? You know, we're working through that now. Um, what you're really talking about are the unwritten rules of the road. Yes. As, as we implement algorithms for um, safely and properly driving autonomously, you have to capture both the written rules of the road, you know, don't drive through stop signs, stop at a red light, don't turn left when, when you don't have the right of way. All of those written rules of the road have to be embedded into the software. And actually, most of those unwritten rules of the road can be captured as part of the prior map annotation. Okay. The unwritten rules of the road have to do with human behavior and anomalies that you experience exactly. in the world. And those unwritten rules of the road are being captured by our observations as we test and as we evaluate the performance of the algorithms in the real world. That's why doing real world testing is so important. We're also testing in a realistic virtual world environment where we can simulate driving. And the reason we're doing that is we need to experience these autonomous vehicles in scenarios that are difficult to, oh, to create. Create in, the real in real world. in a physical way. Exactly. Oh, I see. And Interesting. So the number of scenarios we need to experience, including some of these wacky things that might require you to violate the written rules of the road they can be generated in the virtual environment and we can evaluate what do you do and how do you do that responsibly and accurately. And I'll end just by giving you a very simple example that we've already implemented into the code. Imagine coming to a four-way stop. You know what the rules of the road are. If you got there first, the other cars come, you're supposed to have the right of way. Right. Not everybody does that. Sometimes you get there first, somebody else gets there maybe a little bit later and they think, well, I'm gonna go ahead and go. That's an unwritten rule of the road. Mm -hmm. We will actually look at that and monitor the behavior of the cars at a four-way stop and take our turn only when it's safe to do so. And if everyone keeps doing that, then you have to do some things that are called like nudging. The car will have to nudge forward to show mm -hmm. that, hey, I need a turn here, <laughs> okay? We're working on that nudging technology right now. <laughs> We've all been there, like, where well, the light's not working, it's just flashing red, and we're all trying to read each other's, yes. you know, body language, who's going first, and all that. That's incredible. Right. Dr. Washington, thank you so much for that great insight and information. And now we have a few questions from our audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Washington. Um, can you speak to us about the question of cybersecurity? And have you addressed that? That's a very important point. Um, we're addressing all aspects of security associated with enabling autonomous vehicles. Cybersecurity is of paramount importance because we live in a digitally connected world, as you know, and the more digitally connected you are, 
the more you have to be secure and have to pay attention to it. So we have a, a team of experts evaluating all of the potential attack vectors that one might use to undermine and attack or do something bad to an autonomous vehicle. And the attack surface for an autonomous vehicle is actually larger than for a personally owned vehicle because you have multiple people getting in and out of it. And so we're looking into how do you need to ensure that when the next passenger gets in, that nothing bad has happened to that autonomous vehicle from a cyber point of view, from the electrical architecture, et cetera, et cetera. We have a team of experts looking at it very deeply because your safety and security is our first priority. Okay, thank you so much. That's a great question. Thank you very much, Dr. Washington. This is very exciting technology, even for those of us who are scared to death to use it. Um, <laughs> But I am struck by all of the people who are going to lose work with automatic cars. I mean, it's taxis, it's Uber, it's livery car drivers. Someone from one of the major aerospace companies talked about what they are doing to provide money for technical education so that more young people have a shot at the more sophisticated jobs of the future with robots and automatic cars taking away so many jobs. Is Ford taking an active role in that kind of uh, technical education for young people today? Absolutely. In fact, I'm one of the co-champions for Ford's STEM initiatives. And one of the things that we invest in in our STEM programs is uh, the robotics program. So we, we actually sponsor FIRST Robotics, which is a fabulous program to get young people interested in and excited in robotics technology. We also have a very active partnership with multiple universities that are um, educating our, our university students in the field of robotics and artificial intelligence and machine learning. So we're providing uh, these resources so that young people can have the skills to enter these knowledge jobs is, is a really important aspect of our strategy. I'm very pleased to hear about all the investment that Ford is making. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for your insight. Thank you for coming, Doctor. Uh, we really appreciate your being here at Town Hall. Our biggest problem in Los Angeles is traffic congestion. What's this going to do as far as congestion is concerned? Hmm. We think over time it will help congestion for two reasons. One is a lot of the ride services today that have come into cities like Los Angeles very significantly. They have drivers that are looking for their next ride. And while they look for their next ride, they're adding to congestion. An autonomous ride service won't be doing that because autonomous ride services will be part of a fleet that's scheduled, that has analytics built into it. You can service the uh, requirements with fewer vehicles. The second thing that it will do to help congestion is, instead of you driving your personally owned vehicle to your destination, and then looking for a parking spot, you will be delivered to that destination and that vehicle then takes someone else. And so it, that will be a vehicle that won't reside in the city permanently and it won't be a vehicle that is circling around looking for a parking spot. By some estimates, uh, up to 30% even more of traffic congestion is caused by vehicles circling around neighborhoods looking for parking spots and so that will be eased by having these vehicles enter into society. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Washington, thank you so much for being here on Town Hall and for insight into a fascinating part of our automotive industry. For more information on today's episode or the series, go online to kcet.org slash townhall. I'm Val Zavala. Thanks for watching. Funding of this presentation is made possible by Trader Joe's, Dickerson Employee Benefits, Kennedy Wilson, Payton and Regal, Chevron, and AEG.